attributes. So from an Islamic perspective, God's attributes are unique. And this is what distinguishes Islam from all of the other religious expressions in the world today. That what is common to all of the other religious expressions is that the attributes of God have been given to His creation in some way, shape, or form. No matter what system you look into, you will find that these attributes have been given either to human beings, where you have God-men or a God-man, or it is to some of the creatures, as may be held in, in a variety of other uh, religions. Historically, we have found people worshipping either animal figures or imaginary animal figures composed of a variety of animals, maybe with a mixture of human beings, etc., etc. But objects of worship, in general, end up being objects from God's creation. What is usually raised as a question in this regard is one, what then do Muslims visualize? See, since everybody else who's worshipping God visualizes God, they have images, either of human beings, animals, uh, trees, or whatever. They visualize God through these images. What then do Muslims do? And we have to explain to them, to clarify for them, that we do not visualize God. Because if we strive to visualize God, then we have visualized His creation. Because we can only visualize what we have seen. If I tell you about something you have never seen, having attributes and qualities you have never perceived in any way, shape or form, then you cannot visualize it. I mean, these are among the things of this world. If I tell you about a fruit in Sumatra, which you have never tasted, I can only tell you it's like a mango, and it looks like a this, and it feels something like a that. But can you actually really perceive of what this is? No, until you taste it, you cannot. This is the nature of human beings. We cannot see our senses, cannot perceive or understand what we haven't experienced. So, for a human being to try to visualize God, and some people say, okay, well, God's a spirit. Then, when people say God is a spirit, something comes to mind. That spirit is some kind of a smoky, hazy kind of a thing. You know, there are people still are going to try to put something in their mind of what a spirit looks like. So, in Islamic perspective, we don't even say God is a spirit. We don't say this. The spirits are created. The human spirit is created by God. It's not a part of God in human beings, which again, some people, you know, though they say, yes, God is one, unique, and everything else, but there is a piece of God in you and me. You know, that spirit is a part of God. This is a common belief. And of course, once you open that door, so for somebody to say that part of God's spirit is inside you and is inside me, there only remains for somebody to pop up and say, well, guess what? Yes, it's true. God's spirit, part of it is in you and is in me. But God's spirit is more in me than you. Therefore, you should direct your worship towards me. Because God's spirit is concentrated in me. You know, you have this kind of philosophies evolving, which encourage people towards the worship of human beings. Whereas, from the Islamic perspective, as I said, you know, God is unique. In the purest sense. He does not have the attributes of human beings. When he is worshipped, he is worshipped by way of his attributes, by our knowledge of his attributes. We worship him knowing that he is the most merciful. We worship him knowing that he knows whatever we think, whatever we have done. We worship him knowing that he is forgiving, 
that he has control over all things. Since everything which takes place in the universe is by his permission, then our worship should be directed to him. So this is how we worship God without trying to visualize him in any way, shape or form. So for us, the Kaaba, the direction in which Muslims worship in Mecca, is not an object of worship. The true life of the Muslim starts at death. If you wish to enhance your knowledge of the Islamic perspective on the hereafter, this life doesn't go on forever. But we do so little to prepare for it because most of us don't know what happens after this life ends. If you want to be amongst those who know, then join us every Saturday at 1930 GMT for the inevitable journey. The Kaaba, the direction in which Muslims worship in Mecca is not an object of worship. And it is not an intermediary through which we worship God. Because it is possible to go to Mecca and worship inside of the Kaaba. And nobody who has an idol who he worships to will climb inside of his idol and start worshiping. Because if he does, then he's no longer worshipping his idol, he's somewhere else, he's going outside of the idol. So his worship, those who are involved in worship through idols, they will always have to have that idol visualized in front of them. They work through the idol, either in a picture or in the form of a statue or a human being or whatever. But nobody, it would be considered sacrilegious to go inside of the idol to worship. So from an Islamic perspective, the Kaaba is only a direction of worship. It focuses the direction for the organization of prayer. So pre people and mosques are lined up in that direction all over the world, which would appear if one were to rise above the earth as concentric circles from Mecca over the rest of the earth. So it's only a direction of worship. In fact, the Kaaba was broken down at one point in time. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, informed us that in the future, it will be broken down again. As one of the signs of the last day, an individual will come, an Ethiopian will come, and he will smash it. It will be broken down. But worship will not cease. Worship will not cease. We do not have to have a picture of the Kaaba to worship. So it is only for the organization of worship and not an object of worship or an intermediary through which we worship. The other point concerning God in Islam, Allah, is that the term Allah, we do not necessarily hold to be the name of God in the sense that all other names are illegitimate. Allah is an Arabic term. So the Semitic languages, the ancient among them, whether it's Aramaic or Syriac or Amharic, etc., these ancient Semitic languages all refer to God as Allah. But if one finds, as I found when I visited Korea some years back, that the name which the Koreans had for God, Hanonim, which was the name they used before Christianity came there, and before even Buddhism arrived there. It referred to God with attributes very similar to the attributes as God is described in Islam, then we would have to say that obviously the Prophet who would have been sent there, because from Islamic beliefs, Prophets were sent to all nations and tribes, that the Prophet 
communicating the teachings of Islam to those people would have communicated it in their own language. As Allah said in the Quran that he only sent prophets speaking the language of the people because the duty of the prophet is to convey. So that quite conceivably is a legitimate name for God. The only thing that we reject is where these names contain other meanings. Those other meanings we reject. But the pure meaning of God being the creator, sustainer of the universe who is unique in his attributes, this is God, Allah, in whatever language you express it. The other point of misconception, and this arises amongst Christians with regards to Muslims because of that historic struggle known as the Crusades, is that Muslims reject Jesus. And of course, when one goes to the Quran, the basic scripture of Islam, one finds otherwise. In fact, Jesus' name is mentioned more often in the Quran than Muhammad's. May God's peace and blessings be on both of them. It's not to say that Jesus is mentioned more times in the Quran than Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon them. But that by name, Jesus is mentioned more often. In fact, we even have a chapter of the Quran named Maryam, Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, it is not true that Muslims reject Jesus, but they reject the concept of Jesus being God. This is what is rejected. The concept of Jesus being God or the Son of God. Son of God, which in Christian theology, in essence, means that Jesus was God. God became man and dwelt among men. This is what is rejected by Muslims. But the virgin birth of Jesus, which today many uh, Christian theologians amongst the Protestants are rejecting. You know, you have many today who question and reject even Jesus' virgin birth. For Muslims, it is a point of belief. If a Muslim denies that Jesus was born from a virgin, he or she who denies it denies Islam because they're denying the clear text of the Quran. So it is a point of faith for Muslims to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. However, virgin birth from an Islamic perspective does not elevate Jesus to Godhood. Does not give him any aspect of divinity because birth is a quality of creation, not the creator. Because once you're talking about birth, whether it's virgin or otherwise, you're talking about creation. You're no longer talking about God. So virgin birth does not indicate divinity. It's not evidence for divinity. As the law in the Quran himself states, that the example of Jesus is that of Adam. Jesus is like Adam. Allah created them by the command be, and they were. That is the bottom line. And we look at Jesus' creation by the Virgin Mary as being a completion of the modes by which human beings were created. There are four basic modes. Until the birth of Jesus, three existed. Human beings created without fathers or mothers. That was Adam. A human being created without a mother. That was Eve. 
Human beings created with fathers and mothers. 